this is a view of the Earth that you're probably not familiar at looking at all the time, looking down over the North Pole. Here you've got the Arctic Ocean. It's about 14 million square kilometres, and it's surrounded by land on all of its sides. But then you have these regions where water can flow in and out in here through the Bering Strait into the North Pacific, and then here through the Fram Strait and the Davies Strait into the North Atlantic. In the winter, the temperatures across the ocean, on average, get down to about minus 30. And because of these cold temperatures, the seawaters freeze, and it forms a layer of ice known as sea ice. And on average, that ice is about two, two and a half meters thick, and below it is kilometers of the ocean. And in the winter, that ice completely fills the Arctic basin and even reaches out through the Bering Strait into the Bering Sea. Now, in the summer, that ice cover starts to retreat as the temperatures get warmer. In the summer, the average temperature across the Arctic Ocean is around zero degrees. And this video that you've been watching here shows the summer-September ice extent minimum. Um, it's from the National Snow and Ice Data Center in the USA. And it's something you might be familiar with in the press. Every year around September, you see headlines about um, we've reached another minimum Arctic sea ice extent. Um, it's a downward trend since the satellite records began in 1979. So... And then you often get kind of speculation about when the Arctic ice cap is going to be ice-free in the summer and whether the North West Passage will be open. Um, I'm going to go back to PowerPoint now. But this isn't the melting and freezing of the ice cover that the ice cover changes. The ice is also moved around by the winds. It's dynamic. And what you're looking at here is a video that um, I took while I was on an ice camp in the Arctic. And it's two um, ice floes basically being blown by the wind and they're crushing together. There's actually the sound that you could hear um, just before they lowered the volume was the sound of actually the ice floes, the ice pushing up against each other. So as the ice is being moved around, it's forming these ridges and it's thickening dynamically. The other thing that happens as the ice moves is that it splits apart. And again, this was a picture I took during an ice camp. Um, we'd gone in for dinner into our mess tent and came out kind of just as the sun was setting. And we were greeted by this view about 100 metres from where we were camping. The ice flow we were on had actually split in two. So we were quite glad it hadn't happened kind of straight down the centre of our camp. Um, but it was an amazing view. And what happens here in the winter, because the, warm, the ocean is a lot warmer than the atmosphere, it will lose heat to the atmosphere, and then ice, new ice will form. So these areas of open water become production areas for the formation of ice. So those figures I showed, or that animation I showed you at the beginning with the ice extent changing from year to year, um, it's changing for two reasons. One, because it's melting or it's refreezing, and the other thing, because it's changing dynamically. So we don't just need to know how that area is changing. We also really need to know how the ice thickness is changing, because then we can work out how the ice volume may be changing. Now, sea ice has kind of an important role in our climate system. Something that you may be familiar with is, is, is the idea of the ice albedo feedback mechanism. So albedo is a me measure of the amount of solar radiation that's reflected back into space. So sea ice covered by a layer of fresh snow has a very high albedo, about 0.9. That means it reflects more radiation back into space than the open water does. That absorbs more radiation. So when you have more open water, more radiation is absorbed. You get more heating. That can go on to melt more ice and so on. And of course, the converse is true. When you have more ice cover, you get more radiation reflected and you can get cooling. But this isn't the only way the sea ice affects our climate. It forms on the ocean, so it forms a barrier between the atmosphere and the ocean. On the open ocean, the winds can freely kind of move the water, but this isn't the case in the Arctic. So that's another effect that it can have on, on um, our climate system. And the third thing is that when it melts, it adds fresh water into the ocean. When it freezes, it adds salt into the ocean. So that can affect the density of the water. But it's not just the sea ice that's an important component of the freshwater in the Arctic. Now, this diagram here describes a kind of simple structure of the Arctic Ocean. The sea ice actually sits in a very cool, fresh layer, and that's separated from warm, salty Atlantic waters beneath by a thing called the halocline. So halo means salty and cline means slope. It's a steep density gradient that's 
controlled by salinity that separates these two very distinct water masses. Now, I've said that sea ice is, forms a contribution to that fresh water in the top, but it's not just that. At the beginning, you saw the map of the Arctic, and it was surrounded by continents. And as you move into the summer, those, um, the rivers in those continents thaw, and the river runoff runs into the Arctic Ocean, and that provides another source of fresh water. You've also got cha changes in fresh water from precipitation and evaporation, and also exchanges through those outlets that I showed you into the North Pacific and North Atlantic. Um, this diagram here is taken from a paper and it shows the mean distribution of that liquid fresh water in the Arctic. And you'll notice it, the red colours basically show where you've got more of that fresh water. And that's predominantly in the Western Arctic. So here you've got Greenland and this is the Canadian archipelago. And this is an area um, known as the Canada Basin and um, in it contains the Beaufort Gyre, which is something I'm going to talk a bit more about later on. Um, now, we're interested in the storage and distribution of this fresh water because if it's released, even in part, it has the potential to disrupt the thermohaline circulation, which then could have a knock-on effect to our climate in northern Europe. So this slide is basically to summarise UCL's heritage with working with the European Space Agency to use satellites to look at the changes in the Arctic. Um, this photo here was taken of the remote sensing group at the Mullard Space Science Laboratory, which is also known as MSSS, MSSL, and it's part of UCL. This photo was taken about 20 years ago, but actually our heritage um, with this kind of work starts even earlier than that, around the early 1980s, 1982 to 1983. MSSL um, led a study for the European Space Agency looking at the feasibility of using satellites to monitor changes in the Arctic. But it wasn't really until the launch of the um, Earth Remote Sensing Satellites, which are known as ERS-1, um, that was launched in 1991. Um, we can use data from 1993 onwards. It wasn't until those satellites were launched that we were actually able to have observations over the Arctic. Previously, the satellites didn't go up that high. We can actually see, take data from there. And it was really work done during this time by Seymour Luxon, who's sitting in the audience here, that pioneered the method that we use to um, calculate or estimate sea ice thickness from, from space. And I'm going to go on to the next few slides and describe actually what this technique is and how we're actually doing it. So all of those satellites you saw on the last slide, um, you carry an instrument known as a radar altimeter. So the first bit of that is radar. Now, radar is a really useful tool for Earth's observation. This diagram here shows the um, opacity of the atmosphere to different wavelengths of radiation. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea that um, an X-ray can see through your skin and it can make a map of your bones. Well, a radar can see through our atmosphere, it can see through the clouds, and it can monitor what's going on at the surface of the Earth. So that's why we use that frequency in Earth observation. It also doesn't rely on having daylight, which if you're using something in the visible wavelengths, then when it's dark, you're not going to see anything. So it's useful for getting year-round measurements over the Earth. Now, the second word I mentioned was um, an altimeter. Now, this slide describes the measurement principle for an altimeter. And if you cast your mind back to your school days, I'm sure you'll remember the relationship speed equals distance over time. And that's basically what we're doing here. The altimeter transmits a pulse of radiation. It travels down to the surface of the Earth, is reflected from the surface, and travels back up to the satellite. And we measure the time taken for that pulse of radiation to travel from the satellite to the Earth and back again. Now, we know how fast the radiation is traveling. We know the time. So from that, we can work out the elevation of the satellite above the surface that we're looking at. So over the Arctic Ocean, we have that, those areas of open water, the leads. So we measure the elevation to the leads, and then we measure the elevation to the ice flows next to them. And if we take the difference between those measurements, we can calculate the freeboard of the ice. So that's the amount of ice that's sticking up above the ocean surface. Now, to kind of simply explain what we do next to estimate ice thickness from this measurement, um, the ice is floating, and roughly nine-tenths of the ice is below the water level. 
In reality, it's a little bit more complicated from this. We have to take into consideration things like the snow depth and density that's sitting on top of the ice and how it weights the ice down. Um, we have to consider the ice density and the water density as well. But that basically describes the principle of the measurement and what we're looking at. Now, as I said today, I want to present you our most recent results, and I don't really have time to go into what we've looked in in the past. Um, both Seymour and myself have looked at how the Arctic ice thickness has been changing. But today, I'm just going to take the measurements over the ocean. And this research started a couple of years ago when we started looking at these oceanographic measurements on their own, and we noticed something was going on. Now, this is a, a video that's been made using our data. The reds mean that the sea surface height is getting higher. And we were looking at data between 1995 and 2010. And what we could see is the sea surface height getting higher and higher. This area is in the Western Arctic, um, that area I pointed out to you earlier, where you get the largest storage of fresh water. So obviously, after seeing this in the, our data, we wanted to find out what was going on. So our first port of call was to go and actually have a look in the literature and see what other people had been observing. Now, this figure here is from some work by Rabe et al. And what they've done is taken in situ measurements, so measurements that have actually been made from being on the Arctic Ocean, so from a ship or um, being in an ice camp or having a, a mooring floating around or a buoy floating around. Um, here they've got data from 1992 to 1999. There's some very small black dots on this plot which actually show where the data are. It's only data during the summer, and that's because there's a well, there's not many measurements during kind of Arctic winters. It's difficult to get up to the Arctic when it's dark and it's so cold to actually make in situ observations, which is why satellites are really useful because they can provide kind of a large scale view all year round of what's going on. So they collected measurements during the 1990s, and this group of scientists then compared that to measurements collected during the summer between 2006 and 2008. And what you can see when you just look at these two graphs, this shows the amount of fresh water. And you can see here, on, here's the colour scale, so you're getting more fresh water in those later years. This plot here shows the difference between the two. And when they um, added this up over the whole of the Arctic, they got a number that was 8,400 cubic kilometres. Now, to give you an idea of how much that was, um, the figures I showed you earlier with the fresh water in that top layer of the Arctic Ocean, that contains about 70,000 or just over 70,000 cubic kilometres. If you were to melt all the sea ice, that would add about 10,000 cubic kilometres. So that number's kind of similar to the amount you'd have in all of the sea ice. But it wasn't only these guys that had also seen a change in the freshwater storage. This was another study done by some scientists, and they had a hydrographic survey that took place in April and March 2008, and they compared that to a climatology. So a climatology just means like an average state. And that average state was collected from, or made up from data collected between, um, I think, 1950s to the 1980s. Um, then there was another study, and they had four moorings, again, situated in the Western Arctic. And they saw an increase in fresh water during the noughties as well, when they compared that back to the climatology, I think, that was collected during the 1950s. So, all of this data was, was pointing towards this, they're kind of snapshots in time showing us that something is changing in the Arctic, the freshwater storage is changing. Next thing um, a lot of these papers did was they used um, models to go and have a look at what was controlling that storage of fresh water. And what these models told them was that the wind was having an effect on that storage and distribution. Now, this diagram here shows you what happens when the wind blows on the ocean. So the thick white arrows, that's the wind. The thick blue arrows describe the average movement of the wind-driven layer, and the thin blue arrows um, show the direction of the surface current. Now, you might notice when you're looking at this figure, the direction of the um, wind-driven layer, the way the water is moving, is at right angles to the way that the wind's blowing. And this was first spotted by a um, Norwegian explorer and scientist, Nansen. And in the 1890s, Nansen decided he wanted to reach the North Pole. And he thought the way to do this was to sail his ship, which was called the Fram, around kind of the Russian side of the Arctic and let the Fram freeze into the ice and then 
drift with the ice, and then hopefully the um, ice drift would take him to the North Pole. So um, Nansen embarked on this voyage, and he stayed with the ship for about a year while it was frozen into the Arctic ice pack. But as they were drifting, he noticed that the ice didn't drift in the same direction as the wind. It dr drifted kind of an angle 20 to 40 degrees to the side of it. And when he finally returned from this kind of epic adventure, he got back and explained what he'd seen to other scientists. And Ekman, who I think was a PhD student at the time, came up with his theory of wind-driven currents to explain the motion of the water in response to the winds blowing on them. So the average movement of that wind-driven layer is known as the Ekman transport of water. And so you can see in this situation here where we've got anticyclonic circulation. So that's winds blowing around in a clockwise direction. Um, you've got the water converging into the centre of that anticyclone, and that's making the water pile up, and that changes the sea surface height. So that's that sea surface height here, and that's something we can measure using, using our satellites. Um, on the other side, when you've got a more cyclonic circulation system, you've got the opposite thing happening. You've got the sea surface height lowering in the centre and then raising at the edges. And what the climate models or um, the Arctic Ocean models showed was that when you had the um, more anti-cyclonic circulation regimes, fresh water was stored. And then when you had more cyclonic, that fresh water was pushed to the margins of that circular Arctic basin, where it could be more readily released to the um, North Atlantic. So what we can do now is take our sea surface height data and we can take some wind data. And these two figures here show you this one here, A, is the trend in the sea surface height. So again, that's that Western Arctic. That's the Beaufort Gyre. And this is a trend. So it's how the sea surface height is changing through time. And what's happening here is that you're getting an increase in the doming of that gyre. Um, the center points are, are increasing faster than the bits around the edges. Now, when you look at the other plot at what the wind's doing, going more blue, going more negative, means that the winds are becoming more anticyclonic. So we've got, as we would expect from what the models were predicting, we've got the evidence for the sea surface height doming and the winds becoming more anticyclonic. And then we, when we took our sea surface height data and we did our calculations, we worked out that the change in sea surface height due to, or sorry, the change in the freshwater content due to the change in sea surface height was about 8,000 cubic kilometres. So that fits in very well with what's been um, seen in the in situ observations. Um, however, I wanted to look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, so I decided just to take that Western Arctic region and average over it on a year-by-year -year basis and then look at how that rise in the sea surface actually happened on a year-to-year -year basis. And this is what you're looking at on this graph here. Now, there's quite a lot to take in on this graph. On the axes here, we have the sea surface height, and that's in pink. And then this side here, we have the wind, and that's in blue. Um, as the wind becomes... As the trend here becomes more negative, you get increasing anticyclonicity. Um, what was really striking about this plot when we looked at it, and what surprised us a bit, was it looks like there's two types of behaviour going on here. Now, in the second half of our time period, it looks like the relationship we'd expect. The wind is going that way, and the sea surface height is going that way. But that's not as obvious in the first half of the time period. I'll just clean up the graph a bit so it might make it kind of even more clear. Um, so the obvious question to us all is, why is this happening? Why, why are we not seeing this expected relationship that we've kind of got the overall evidence, but when we look on a year-to-year -year basis, it's, it's not quite as simple as that. Um, and there are a number of different reasons you can think about. Um, Ekman transport um, and changes in that Ekman transport aren't the only... Um, things that control the storage of fresh water. You can think about other things like kind of lateral evection of water coming in from the sides or changes in mixing. But another, I think, quite interesting question is are changes in the ice cover affecting how the winds kind of um, stir up the ocean? Now, earlier on in the lecture, I described to you how the Arctic sea ice forms a barrier between the atmosphere and the ocean. So that affects the transfer of momentum between the atmosphere and atmosphere in the ocean. So 
it's feasible that changes in the sea ice cover could affect that transfer. And then maybe towards the latter half of our time period, the wind is becoming more efficient at spinning up the ocean. Um, now, there is actually other things in the scientific literature that could also point to this kind of change in the ice cover. Um, there has been research done by a guy called Ram Powell who's looked at the ice deformation rate, so um, how often you get things like the leads forming in the ice cover, how easy it is to move around. And he's seen that during a year, during that latter half of the time period, that the deformation rate increased, and that implies that the mechanical strength of the ice decreased, which would change its response to the winds and the ocean currents. So, Maybe there is something going on here. Um, I think there's other, um, another paper that was published at the end of last year um, by a guy called Spring who looked at changing ice velocities over the Arctic and talked about how the ice velocity can be fully explained with what the wind was doing. So I think there's other evidence that kind of points towards perhaps something's going on here. And um, in the future, this is a question that I, I intend to go and investigate further. At the moment, I'm being quite speculative about the reasons for, for that disparity I showed you in our last data pot, but I think it's a very interesting question. And it's not just because of the controls and the storage and distribution of fresh water. Now, if you cast your mind back to that schematic I showed you earlier, I showed you how the, um, that cool, fresh layer where the sea ice forms is separated from the warm, salty water, Atlantic water. Now, that warm, salty water contains enough heat to melt all of the Arctic sea ice in four years if it could get brought up to the surface. So I think another question from this research is that if you've got a change in coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean due to change in the ice cover, could you increase the turbulent mixing in the ocean? Could you bring more of that heat up? And then could that be another feedback to the ice retreat? And I think these are all really interesting questions that we can go on to look at with the satellite data and the new observations from Cryosat. So now we're going to move on to um, Cryosat. So in 1999, the European Space Agency put out a call to scientists and asked them to come up with ideas for satellites, satellites that would monitor our environment or satellites that could help tell us more about climate change. And at UCL, um, a proposal was put forward for a satellite called Cryosat. It was led by Professor Duncan Wingham. Um, it also invo involved Seymour Laxon. And they designed a satellite that would be dedicated to monitoring the polar regions. Everything I've shown you before, from the ERS satellites and MVSAT satellites, which is the work that I've been working on previously, has been done with satellites that weren't, say, optimised for looking at the Arctic or the Antarctic. You may have noticed in those plots I showed you, showing the trends, there's a hole in the centre. And that's, that's not because there's, there's nothing there. It's because the satellites don't monitor that high. Um, Cryosat was different because its orbit was different to those satellites. It's designed to fill in that hole. It goes all the way up to 88 degrees. And its orbit's also designed so it has the densest number of sampling points um, in the polar regions. But it's not just that that makes Cryosat different. It carries an enhanced radar altimeter. And I'm not going to go into the details of, of how that works, but basically it it's processing, or the way it works, it has the effect of reducing the footprint on the ground. Now, by footprint, what I mean is, if you imagine you had a torch, so your, your torch has quite a small bit of light coming from here. If I was to shine it at that wall, you'd have a much larger area illuminated on the wall because the beam was diverging. So if you imagine a satellite in space, it's, it's transmitting a pulse of radiation, but that diverges, and when it reaches the ground, the area that it's illuminating on a conventional altimeter is the order of kilometers. However, Cryosat employs enhanced processing techniques that reduces that area of illumination on the ground to 300 metres in its across track. Um, and that means that we get a better resolution of measurement. It should make it easier for us to pick out those leads in the sea ice cover. But it's not only that that it does. It takes multiple shots, multiple looks at the same point on the ground. So that means we can average all of those, those looks to reduce the noise in our data. And another advantage Cryosat 2 has is that when it's passing over the ice sheets over Antarctica and Greenland, it can measure the slope of the edges, and that's where a lot of the ice mass is lost. 
So Cryosat 2 followed Cryosat 1. And I just finished my PhD um, in 2005. And my first job as a postdoc was to actually test the sea ice processing chain. And in 2005, a group of us went to the, one of the European Space Agency bases to sit in a room and watch the launch event live um, and watch this satellite go up into space. And this photo really is the last view that we had of that satellite. Um, it was launched and we sat there. I think this is us kind of sitting in the, in the room looking a little bit worried. And we waited for about 15 minutes. After that time, you expect the satellite to send a signal back down to Earth to tell you that it's in the orbit, it's where it should be. But that didn't happen. So we waited another hour, and still, still nothing from the satellite. And so by that point, of course, we're all getting a bit worried. And eventually, I actually got a text from one of my friends saying, I'm sorry about your satellite. And so they, they had somehow found out um, um, before I did that, that actually it had exploded on launch and when it was passing over the Arctic, actually. But the European Space Agency quickly agreed to build another version of the satellite. And um, in April 2010, again, we went to a European Space Agency base. And we were probably a little bit more nervous this time after what had happened last time. But I think you can probably see by the smiling faces in this photo that actually this launch went well and we were all absolutely delighted. A few of those faces are from that photograph I showed you from um, the Remote Sensing Laboratory at MSSL 20 years ago. Richard Francis um, was there who, was, who now works for the European Space Agency is the mission manager for Cryosat. Duncan Wingham who led the proposal. Um, so obviously we were all delighted that, that, that it had gone well this time. So following the launch of Cryosat, it hasn't all stopped there. UCL is still very involved with um, the work that's going on. Not only will we be looking at the data and analysing it to look at how the Arctic and the Antarctic is changing, but we're also kind of making sure that we really understand the data. And part of that is validating our measurements over the Arctic sea ice. Now, in April last year, myself, Seymour, and Rosie Willett, who's a PhD student in CPOM, all went up to the Arctic to actually take a radar and go and investigate how the radar was penetrating into the snow and ice cover. Um, it was quite a complicated experiment. Um, what we wanted to do was to be able to sample different ice types. Now, this plot here is data from a guy called Christian Haas, um, who was also heavily involved in organizing and participating and um, designing this field experiment. Um, he's at the University of Alberta. So this is data from an instrument called uh, Electromagnetic Bird. It basically looks like a missile, and it's towed from an aircraft, and it's towed so it's, it flies at about 10 metres above the ice, and it transmits the signal that then can be processed, and from that we can um, measure the ice thickness from an aircraft. And that's what this, uh, this is. This is transects of an aircraft flying out over the Arctic ice cover, and the colour codes show the thickness. So you can see here it's thicker nearer the coast. This is Greenland. This is um, the Canadian archipelago. And as you fly out, it gets a bit thinner. And what we wanted to do is sample that, that gradient in thickness. So to do that, we had to get ourselves up to a place called Alert, which is, sorry, I keep losing the mouse, which is about here. And it's a Canadian military base. And then from there, we got onto um, a small aircraft and we flew out onto the Arctic Ocean where we landed on the ocean, um, on, the frozen, on the ice, on the frozen ocean, and got all our kit out, then did our experiments um, with our radar. We did ground surveys back in the plane and then back to um, the base. And we set up two sites, a north and south site on the ice and um, a base as well on the ice that was um, land fast to the coast. Um, the other part of this experiment is that it's difficult to take measurements that you make on the ground, say you've got a radar and you're just looking at the ground, it's maybe you're looking at a metre square, to something that you're observing from space because of the different scales. So another really important part of this field experiment was to use aircraft to tie in the measurements that we're making on the ground to the measurements that Cryosat was making. So not only did we have us on the ground, we had aircraft flying over us and then Cryosat flying over them. So logistically, it was quite a, a big organisation thing um, and a lot of that organised by the European Space Agency. <laughs> 
So this is alert. You can't get a commercial flight there. We had to fly up in a little twin otter aircraft. Um, you can see us all kind of packed into the aircraft with all our kit at the front. Um, it's the northliest, most place on Earth where people actually live. Um, we're really dependent on weather when we do this. We can't land on the ice if um, the visibility is poor. Remember, no one's been to where we're flying to before. There's no runway. Um, there has been an incident of them losing a plane through the ice before as well. So the pilots need to make sure they can actually see what's going on. They can see if there's any lumps and bumps. So this is Troy, our pilot, who's kind of was looking at the weather reports every day to see if we could fly. On the days that we couldn't fly, we put everything, all our kit onto skidoos and went down to the ice that was grounded to the coast um, and kind of practice experiments, set up an experiment site there. Um, we'd also spend time in the warehouses setting up a kit. Um, these are polar bear tracks, which I'm very glad to say that we didn't actually see the bear that had made them because it's not something I particularly want to come into close contact with. Um, but the little tracks next to it, we're not quite sure what they were. Either, either it's a little one or it was stalking something, one of the two. So when we finally could make it out, um, we uh, set up two sites on the ice, a north and south site. We put out things like these bright orange tarpaulins and bin bags filled with snow. So the aircraft, when they fly over, would have a target. What the aircraft are trying to hit are these things. They're called corner reflectors. And they um, provide a very bright target for the aircraft, but they're difficult to spot when you're flying. So putting things like this, like the bin bags, just provides a simple target for them. Um, here, one of our colleagues is also drilling through the ice that we landed on to see how thick it was. It was about 1.8 meters, I think, here. Um, then, as I mentioned, we also had the overflights. NASA, um, NASA had a plane up in the Arctic during the time we were there, so they overflew us as well as the European Space Agency plane. Um, around Alert as well, there's a pack of wolves that um, are quite tame, really, and they, they pose very nicely for photographs like this, while the other one was basically nicking anything that you'd left on the ground in the hope of finding food in it. Um, this is our experiment site from the air. So, we try and lay out sites almost, well, 500 to a kilometre apart. We'd have um, 500 metres to a kilometre. We'd have these corner reflectors. Um, then we do dense snow surveys around them. That graph that you see on this slide shows um, our snow survey and shows how the snow varies. Then we take our radar. We take measurements there. We dig snow pits. We look at density. And we're collecting all this data so we can better understand how the radar penetrates through the snow, which will depend on the snow characteristics. Um, this is just another kind of shot, I think, that Rosie took and just showing our experiment site and just after we've made all our, our survey lines. And this is another shot showing, um, this is actually this, a ridge, so that's when that ice is being pushed together and you're getting that dynamic thickening. And if you actually want to read a bit more about this experiment, um, there's some blogs up at the European Space Agency web website. Um, what I actually thought I'd show you next is it's going to advance. This is a video that shows you actually what it's like to land on the ice. I think it's got sand on it as well. The pilot would have done a couple of laps to check that it looked okay before he actually went in to land. pretty bumpy when you're doing it. So once the aircraft has landed, it will taxi around for a bit to actually flatten the snow down to make sure we can take off again, and also to make sure that the skis don't freeze to the snow and ice because they're quite warm once you've come into land. And then these next few shots might just give you an idea of what it's like to be on the ice. It shows the aircraft flying over the top of us. If you put the sound back up. <laughs> 
guys kind of what I've shown you today. Hopefully, I've um, kind of introduced you really to UCL's fairly long heritage of working with the European Space Agency to use satellites to monitor changes in the Arctic, not only the Arctic, but the Antarctic as well. Um, more recently, the research that our re most recent discovery is that it's not only the ice cover that's changing, we're also being able to observe changes to the ocean circulation. And that's revealing some interesting questions, I think, which is definitely something that I plan to look into in the future and try and understand a bit better the physics of actually what's going on. Um, I think UCL's involvement with Cryosat 2 as well, hopefully you've caught a glimpse of that. That's by no means the full extent of our involvement. Um, there are numerous people in our research group working very hard on looking at the data from Cryosat. Um, the map that's faded out in the background here shows the ice thickness for April 2011. And Seymour is hoping by April this year that we should be able to have the first estimate of ice volume um, since 2008. And that should hopefully give us some information about whether the volume of the ice cover in the ocean has been changing over the recent years as well as the extent. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Catherine, for such an exciting talk. I think we have time for maybe one question, if anyone has any. There's one down the front here. If you could just wait for a microphone so they can hear you online. I have one elementary question, okay. which is something that crops up whenever people talk about the Arctic and the, or the Antarctic. They talk about the West Arctic, and one doesn't know which direction is west when one is so close to the North Pole. How is it related to the Greenwich Mer Meridian? Um, so when I talk about the West Arctic, um, I would put zero going down the Greenwich and then moving towards um, Canada as, as west. That's, that's how I, I think about it or how we talk, typically describe it. And then east would be round kind of the Russian and Siberian side. Okay, I'm afraid that is all we've got time for today. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, and I hope you can make some more events this term. And I'd like you to join me in thanking Dr. Catherine Giles today. Thank you.